Moving on to the third of the big four railway companies of the UK, we take a look at the largest of them all, the London Midland and Scottish Railway, the only British railway firm to have operated routes in England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland, with total trackage that nearly encompassed 20,000 miles. The LMS initially starting out as a severely flawed company, developed from various different and competing sources, but by the mid-1930s would soon find itself rivaling the Art Deco prestige of the LNER for high-speed expresses to the north, as well as supplying a majority of the UK's industrial heart. The LMS was formed from seven constituent and 27 subsidiary companies, the seven constituent companies being the London and North Western Railway, the Midland Railway, the North Staffordshire Railway, and the Furness Railways of England, and the Caledonian, Glasgow and South Western, and Highland Railways in Scotland, many of which had already assimilated scores of smaller lines, as was the case with the London and North Western Railway, which comprised 100 companies, with its latest acquisitions being the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway, and the North London Railways, the latter of which was formally absorbed into the LNWR on November 23, 1922, just over a month prior to the 1921 Railways Act taking effect. While during the early 1900s, the Midland Railway had taken over the London Tilbury and South End Railway and the Belfast and Northern Counties Railways, meaning the extent of the LMS included both mainline, branchline and commuter services that stretched from Bournemouth West in Dorset on the south coast of England to Londonderry and County Derry on the northern coast of Ireland and Thurso in the far north of Scotland. Of these acquired firms, the London and North Western was considered the premier route, with the largest track mileage of 1,807 miles and a trunk main line to Glasgow Central in partnership with the Caledonian Railway, who operated the main line north of Carlisle, while next, in order of length, were the Midland Railway with 1,529 route miles and the Caledonian itself with 896 route miles. The corresponding figures for the other constituent companies being 485 route miles for the Highland, 449 for the Glasgow and South Western, 206 for the North Staffordshire, 115 for the Furness, and 533 for the Lancashire and Yorkshire. The subsidiary companies of the LMS, including the Wirral, serving the Cheshire Peninsula, the Stratford-upon-Avon and Midland Junction, once known as the East and West Junction, the Port Patrick and Wigtonshire Joint, on which ran the Stranra boat expresses via Dumfries, and the Maryport and Carlisle and Cockermouth Keswick and Penrith Railways in Cumberland that formed the Cumbrian coastline although on some routes, even in the days of their independence, their operations were worked by larger companies, examples including the Cockermouth, Keswick and Penrith, whose passenger service was run by the London and North Western, and freight service by the North Eastern Railway. Upon the formation of the LMS in 1923, the system was categorised into four divisions, the Western Division, which included most of the former London and North Western Railway, the Midland Division, which operated the former Midland Railway out of London St Pancras, the Central Division, which comprised the former assets of the Lancashire and Yorkshire, and the Northern Division, that included all three Scottish lines taken over during the grouping. The LMS not only inheriting the premier Anglo-Scottish service from London Euston to Glasgow, as well as various other internal passenger and freight workings within England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, but also operated, in conjunction with the Great Western Railway, the busy cross-country line from Shrewsbury via Craven Arms to Hereford, with onward connections to Newport, Bristol and the west of England and, in association with the Southern Railway, the Somerset and Dorset Joint Line, the route of which ran from Bath Green Park to Bournemouth West, while the Cheshire Lines, operating an express route between Liverpool and Manchester via Warrington, in addition to several branches, belonged jointly to the LMS and the LNER, as did the Midland and Great Northern Joint Railway, which ran from Saxby and Peterborough to Kings Lynn, Cromer, Yarmouth and Lowestoft, these joint railways being two of six LMS and LNER joint committees, and thus meant the firm had connections and joint operations with every other one of the big four railway companies. In Northern Ireland, the LMS owned and worked the Northern Counties Committee, formerly known as the Belfast and Northern Counties Railway, the main line of which ran from Belfast to Londonderry, while other assets in Ireland included the Dundalk, Newry and Greenore Railway, though this was worked by the Irish Great Northern Railway and possessed joint interests with the Irish Great Northern's narrow gauge lines of the County Donegal Joint Committee and the Straban and Letterkenny Railway, making for a company that operated cumulative track work assets that nearly matched the transcontinental routes of the Canadian Pacific Railway, while in terms of overall possessions, the LMS owned the largest stock of locomotives, carriages and wagons in the country, with an audit undertaken on January 1, 1934, illustrating that the company operated 8,004 locomotives, 24,023 coaches, 250 electric motor vehicles, 22 steam rail motors, 3 diesel rail cars, 270,441 wagons, and 15,584 service vehicles. 
the latter including ballast wagons, coal and coke wagons for the use of the locomotive department, gas holder trucks, travelling cranes, tool vans, timber, rail and sleeper trucks, and breakdown cranes, alongside 22 locomotives reserved exclusively for departmental use. While beyond its railway assets, the company also owned 2,088 parcels and goods road motor vehicles, 8,400 horses, 49 steamboats, four of which were jointly owned, 537 miles of canal, multiple railway hotels spread across the nation, among which were some of the finest in the country, and the dockyards of Barrow, Grangemouth, Fleetwood, Hollyhead, Hesham, Garston, Eyre and Troon, handling the largest passenger and goods traffic on the network and earning weekly traffic receipts averaging over £1 million. In terms of passenger operations, by 1935 the LMS boasted the largest number of long-distance non-stop services in Britain, with the Royal Scott Premier train from Glasgow to London Euston via Carlisle, holding the record for longest non-stop express train in the world for nine months, covering the 299 miles between Carlisle and London every weekday in five and a half hours, while the number of trains booked to perform at 55 mile an hour average speeds throughout their journeys was greater than on any other British railway company, with the daily mileage at 60 miles an hour or more from origin to destination reaching a figure of 1,235 route miles during the spring of 1935, all of which was performed on the lines of the former LNWR the fastest train on the LMS network being the 1725 Liverpool to Euston, which covered the 152-mile journey from Crewe to Wilsdon Junction in a mere 142 minutes, thus averaging a speed of 65 miles an hour and therefore making it the second fastest scheduled service in Britain behind the Cheltenham Flyer between Swindon and London Paddington. However, this glory for the LMS was not always the case, especially during the company's early years, as due to the number of constituent railways that had been brought together to create the firm, each of which had their own individual locomotive policies and corporate directions, the initial period of the LMS was plagued with infighting between the various parties that meant no unified direction for the company could be pursued, this being most notable between former directors and executives of the LNWR and the Midland Railway, which had previously fought tooth and nail for the lucrative London to Scotland market, the LMS comprising three drawing and design offices that included the former Midland office in Derby, the LNWR office in Crewe, and the Lancashire and Yorkshire's office in Horwich, to the northwest of Manchester, neither of which would agree on a single locomotive policy. While of their existing fleet of locomotives, the Midland Railway's previous small engine policies, which negated the construction of locomotives beyond the size of a 460, meant their sluggish Fowler-designed engines, such as the 483 and 3835 class, had not enough power to meet the ever-increasing demands of longer trains travelling across greater distances, often being required to work in multiple, that led to a highly inefficient need for duplicated crews and coal supplies to power a single train. While the LNWR had prided itself on far more powerful express passenger locomotives, such as the Cook-designed Clawton class 460s of 1913, though ultimately, the LNWR had not the influence of the Midland when it came to directing the locomotive policies of the LMS. The result was the Midland small engine policy being adopted by the LMS during the 1920s, as demonstrated with the release of the Fowler 4F of 1924, an evolution of the Midland's 3835 class, but in so doing inherited the many problems of the 3835 in that it was designed for freight work of less than 40 miles an hour, the increasing requirement for faster freight transfer, meaning its short axle box bearings were prone to overheating, thus leaving many of these engines out of service undergoing repairs to replace ruined axles this flawed design forming the basis of other LMS locomotives, including, most notably, the LMS's formidable Garrett's, gigantic machines that, even with their increased size and power, were fitted with the Fowler 4F's axle box as a cost-saving measure, thus leading to frequent overheating and breakdowns that precluded the true capabilities of the Garrett's in hauling fast domestic coal supply runs between the pits of the East Midlands and London, the operating and motive power departments of the LMS being satisfied with the Midlands' small engine policy regardless of the fact that the locomotives being produced were extremely unreliable and costing the company a fortune in lost work. The small engine policy pervaded throughout the mid-1920s, while Chief Mechanical Engineer of the LMS, Henry Fowler, previously of the Midland Railway, began development of a new class of express passenger locomotive to replace former LNWR designs on Anglo-Scottish expresses. Initially considering a compound 462 Pacific configuration, but this early proposal was dropped by the OMP departments due to their insistence on the continued use of small engines, leading to the loan of newly constructed Great Western Railway Castle Class No. 5000 Launceston Castle, which was put to work on London to Carlisle Expresses, the Collet 460 quickly demonstrating superb performance on the run, and thus meant the OMP could dismiss Fowler's proposal completely in exchange for a 460 design with three cylinders 
and a simple expansion steam circuit that mimicked the Castle class. The resultant Royal Scott 7P460s of 1927, as built between the North British Locomotive Company in Glasgow and the LMS Derby Works, being strong performers under certain conditions, but were unable to complete the vital Anglo-Scottish Expresses without requiring a locomotive change at Carlisle, a troubling prospect when considering the prestige of trains between London and Glasgow when competing against the LNER's equivalent service from London to Edinburgh, with their premier Flying Scotsman having been made non-stop from 1928 following the introduction of Gresley A1462 Pacifics. The LMS's perceived defeat at the hands of the LNER with the non-stop running of the Flying Scotsman led inevitably to a new locomotive policy being required, and following his successful work on the enlarged 460 King class of the Great Western, William Stanier was drafted in to replace Fowler as chief mechanical engineer in 1931, and through his superb ability to open lines of communication between the competing drawing offices of Derby, Crewe and Horwich, he was able to unify their efforts into the development of a large Pacific locomotive that would finally break the small engine policy the result being the 1933 launch of the Princess Royal class that immediately revolutionised Anglo-Scottish services by allowing for a near non-stop run between London Euston and Glasgow Central, the only halt being required at Carlisle so as to change engine crews. The Princess Royals, together with the latest streamlined Coronation Pacifics, rapidly raising the pace of the LMS when compared to the LNER and ensuring that, for the first time, the company could present a viable opponent on the Anglo-Scottish run. Under his tenure, Stanier rapidly replaced many of the aging Midland and LNWR classes with a slew of new locomotives that would become iconic for their sturdy robustness and exceptional power, including the four MT two- and three-cylinder tank engines, the workhorses of the London Suburban Network, the 5MT-460 Black 5, a mixed-traffic locomotive that became among the most famous and numerous engine classes in Britain, the 6P Jubilee, a high-speed express passenger locomotive used across the vast reaches of the LMS network, and the 8F280 freight engine, a purposeful-looking machine that was so successful that it formed the basis of multiple export variants that saw action across the globe during World War II. The LMS, by the mid-1930s, having dispelled its once tawdry reputation for poor and unreliable locomotives, with a range of up-to-date models that easily matched their contemporaries across the big four companies, while at the same time experimenting with other forms of motive power, including steam turbine locomotives in the form of the unique turbomotive Princess Royal of 1935, Steam and diesel rail cars, including the stylish 80,000 three car Art Deco unit employed on services from London St Pancras to Nottingham, early diesel shunters, including the LMS 12033 series, that would go on to form the basis of the ubiquitous Class 08, of which nearly 1,000 examples were built, and third rail electric multiple units based on an LNWR design that plied their trade in the Liverpool area and on high density commuter services out of London Broad Street. The outwardly innovative appearance of the LMS, though, was sadly not one that reflected how well the company performed financially, as even with it possessing the largest track mileage, locomotive fleet and rolling stock provision in Britain, as well as operating in 32 of the UK's 40 counties, and being the biggest single employer in the country behind the post office, profitability for the firm remained elusive throughout its existence, with a rate of return, at most, being only a meagre 2.7%, the reasons as to the LMS's struggle for profitability being due primarily to its reliance on freight traffic as a means of income with the conveyance of goods representing 60% of the LMS's revenue by the start of the 1930s. And while its goods hauling enterprises were widespread and included many important shipping contracts such as bulk coal, steel, manufactured goods, produce, mail, parcels and other traffic, its dependence on this market meant the company was particularly sensitive to downturns in productivity, as was demonstrated during the collapse of manufacturing and goods demand in the wake of the 1929 Wall Street crash and subsequent Great Depression. The reduction in traffic was compounded further by the obligations of the LMS to the Common Carriers Act, which had been implemented on the railway companies during the 1800s so as to avoid any potential monopolising by the rail transport firms when train travel was by far the fastest means of conveying goods, implementing set rates for the transportation of goods by rail that could not be broken regardless of how unprofitable certain tasks were, meaning that, in the aftermath of the Great Depression, the LMS was forced to maintain set transport tariffs on a rapidly shrinking goods market thus leading to the company's operations becoming desperately unprofitable and leaving the LMS, together with the rival LNER, teetering on bankruptcy, the management of each firm lobbying to the British government to rescind the Common Carriers Act so as to remove this financial millstone from around their corporate necks. But the request of removing the act was denied by Parliament, while the unwavering rates implemented by the railway companies meant their customers, who themselves were losing money heavily as a result of the recession, chose to transfer their conveyance of goods to the budding road transportation which itself was not constrained by the Common Carriers Act. 
Ultimately, the LMS entered World War II in 1939 making barely a profit, and with Britain, for the first time in history, now coming under direct fire from German air raids, the infrastructure of the railway system was heavily damaged throughout the course of the conflict, with stations, rail yards and locomotives all bearing the brunt of Nazi Germany's wrath. The situation of the former LMS by the end of the war being a worn-out and heavily under-maintained system that barely functioned, while the company itself, based on its marginal profit during 1939, was rendered bankrupt by 1945. The Labour government of the newly elected Prime Minister, Clement Attlee, as part of his sweeping nationalisation of British industry, taking the dire situation of the railways as an opportunity to bring the entire network under state control, and following the passing of the 1947 Transport Act, the former assets of the London, Midland and Scottish Railway were absorbed into British Railways alongside the Great Western, the Southern and the LNER, effective January 1, 1948, incorporating from the LMS 19,000 miles of track work, 9,914 locomotives, 50 diesel locomotives, 20,276 coaches, 291,490 freight wagons, 29,754 road vehicles, 8 harbours and dockyards, 3 steamboats, 30 hotels, and 263,000 employees. However, while the LMS was gone, its innovation pervaded through into the era of British railways, with many of the company's pioneering locomotive designs, such as its diesel shunters, being carried forward to form the basis of widespread fleets of engines that would become the backbone of BR's operations. While the former routes of the LMS were split between the London Midland region in England and Wales, and the Scottish region north of the border, while the former Irish assets were maintained briefly by the British Transport Commission, or BTC, until they were purchased for £2.6 million under the provisions of the Transport Act Northern Ireland of 1948, the former Northern Counties Committee lines being integrated into the Ulster Transport Act from April 1, 1949, while going into the 1950s, the former LMS network faced mixed investment from British railways as the freight and passenger market dropped rapidly away due to the influence of road and domestic air transport the flagship West Coast Main Line being provided huge infrastructural upgrades in the form of electrification, which was conducted between 1959 and 1974 along the course of the route from London Euston to Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool and Glasgow, and was hailed as the barnstormer of rail transport's future for high-speed electric trains, while the former Midland Railway out of London St Pancras faced stagnation as its comparatively sluggish course led it to lose out rapidly to both the East and West Coast Main Lines with partial closure proposed on a number of occasions that thankfully never came to pass. Going into the 1970s, the West Coast and Midland Main Lines saw renewed investment as high-speed rail transport began to enter the public consciousness, as per the likes of the Shinkansen of Japan and the Bud Metroliner of the United States, each of these schemes seeing a mixture of glowing success or dismal failure. The introduction of high-speed trains or HSTs onto the Midland Main Line during 1983 turning this once backwater railway and its deteriorating service into a viable connection between London and Northern England, seeing its fortunes turned around and making it once again profitable in terms of passenger operation, while on the West Coast Main Line, so as to avoid the need for the costly construction of dedicated high-speed rail lines, as per the Shinkansen and later TGV of France, British Rail attempted to develop a tilting high-speed train in the form of the Advanced Passenger Train or APT, which between 1972 and 1986 was tested in both gas turbine and electric forms on both the Midland and West Coast routes as a means of increasing train speeds without the need for incredibly expensive infrastructure upgrades. But due to spiralling costs and a government that was ambivalent to the future of rail transport in Britain, the scheme ultimately collapsed just as it was nearing completion during the mid-1980s, becoming a national embarrassment and seeing the technology of tilting trains instead be pioneered by Italy, who would subsequently sell tilting trains back to Britain during the early 2000s. Nevertheless, the introduction of tilting trains, such as the Class 390 Pendolino and Class 220 and 221 Voyager diesel units, was a watershed moment for the operation of the West Coast Main Line, as in combination with a major infrastructure upgrade scheme along the entire course of the route, the dream of regular 125 mile an hour operation could finally be realised on the premier run between London and Glasgow, while the Midland Main Line, thanks to the introduction of Class 222 Meridian units, saw frequencies increased and journey times slashed, as connections between the East Midlands and London by rail became more viable, turning regional centres like Nottingham, Derby, Leicester, Kettering and Bedford into commuter towns for the capital. The desire to overcome the obstacles that had long hampered fast and efficient express trains, as pursued by the likes of William Stanier and his revolutionary new fleet of locomotives, being now easily circumvented with electric and diesel traction. Although sadly, the success of new tilting trains and upgraded railways is offset by the fact that what was once the mighty London Midland and Scottish Railway is now but a fraction of its former self, 
a company that had previously been by far the largest in the country, and had assets in all four nations of the British Isles, both on and off the rails, being now but a fading memory of the UK's railway scene. 